people that he allows us to be a part of his work. Our faith, our work, our service, our worship. The question is not just what are you doing today? That is important. But the question today is, are you going to finish strong? What would you write if you were going to write some way that you wanted to be described honestly, honestly described after your death? It's interesting to see various epitaphs that have been written on people's gravestones. There's a historic cemetery in Key West that is noted for many that have become famous around the world. B.P. Roberts, he asked to have put on his stone, I told you I was sick. Out in New Mexico, John Yeast, we don't know the death date. We don't even know for sure what his occupation was. But he says, here lies Johnny Yeast, pardon me for not rising. Wouldn't it have been cool if he was a baker? Also, <clears throat> the man of a thousand voices, cartoon voices that is, Bugs Bunny, Porky Pig. He wanted the catchphrase for Porky Pig to be on his tombstone. That's all, folks. But then there's others that are serious, that when you look at them, you say, that makes sense. Martin Luther King Jr., Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Or Frank Sinatra wanted to be described as the best is yet to come. John Dempsey, the great heavyweight champion, undisputed heavyweight champion between 1919 and 1926 of boxing. He was described as a gentle man and a gentleman. You just had read very capably, just a few moments, Holy Scripture that described Paul's life. If man was going to choose, how do you describe Paul's life? How do you describe his finish? And we had that read, and it was powerful. Perhaps if it would fit on a tombstone, I suppose everyone would agree that that should be on Paul's tombstone. But what about you? Would that same description that simply is describing faithful Christian living, would that same description be appropriate to place on your tombstone? I'd like for you to read it again, and I'd like for you to just think about the description of one's life as he is nearing death. Look as he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Now he looks back and he says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race, I've kept the faith. And now he looks to the future. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give me to that day and not to me only, but to all those who love is appearing. On this next slide, we just highlighted the three tenses, the present, the past, and the future. He spoke in a present tense about his death being very near and him saying today, I am ready. The reason he could say he was ready because of decisions that he made in the past. He decided whose side he was going to fight on. He decided if he was going to run that course with the Lord. He decided if he was going to keep that faith. And because of his past, he could stand in the present and say, I'm ready, looking forward to the future. I know the crown that is laid up for me. This morning, I would like for us to look at this present time in Paul's life and then come back this evening and we'll look at the past that also gave him great hope for the future. We're studying about souls all year long. What have you really gained if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? You know, when we live our life in view of souls focused toward eternity, it changes the way we view our death. Listen, I know sometimes people will say, well, there's really not that big a difference between a faithful Christian and someone who's just a good neighbor that lives next door. When you and I really start to dig deeply into the Christian faith, we realize that below the surface of what would just be simply a good neighbor versus that of someone who has wholly devoted their life to Jesus Christ, there is a tremendous difference. And one of the differences is usually the way death is viewed. This morning, you may be right on target with Paul. You may read those words in verse six that we're about to study and you may say, I am there with Paul. 
or you may read them and not be. So here's my challenge to you. Will you at least study with an open mind and an open heart? And if you're not where you need to be spiritually as your thinking and your approach towards death, would you at least say, I want to work on that. I want to grow. I want to mature in that area. You see, there are three words or phrases in verse six that I'd like for us to capitalize upon this morning. One is the way he uses the word time. And the next one is the way that he refers to this occasion as a drink offering. And the third one is the way that he refers as this time as a departure. So let's think first about this word time. Let's go back a slide. Now notice there as we read... 1 Timothy 4 and verse 6 again, where he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time, the time of my departure is at hand. Now notice the word time there, even in our English language, it is true, but I'm just letting you know in the Greek, it's so true that it's two different words, just as we would also have different words. In other words, this isn't the time like, hey, do you you have a watch? Do, Do you have a phone? Can you tell me the time? That's not the Greek word here when he says the time of my departure is at hand where Paul looked down at at some kind of sundial and said, well, would you look at that? The the clock is about to strike. I didn't know it was that time already. That's not the, the use of the word here is like we would use the word season, occasion, opportunity. Like right now, if I said to you, it's Christmas time, You understand that the word time there is not referring to a time piece that has the hands on a certain number. Or if we looked outside today and walking in, we felt the chilly uh, temperature and we said, it's winter time out there. You see, it's winter season. It's the occasion for Christmas celebration. You see, when we think about what Paul is saying here, Paul is saying... It's that season in life. It's that season that is going to come to all of us. Please note this. Paul didn't, and you and I don't. We do not create or control this time. Now, I know that a lot of us are OCD, and we like to control everything. You know, it's interesting, even when someone plans uh, trips or even retirement. You can tell different personality types. Some people are like, oh, I looked at six different airlines and I made sure I found one that left at exactly the time we wanted to leave and arrive at exactly the time. Or you talk with someone and they say, I'm retiring this year. Yes, I sat down 30 years ago and I planned this specific year to retire. Look, you can control the time you're going to get your hair cut tomorrow. You can control a lot of the appointments that you'll make. You may control when you retire. You may control when you fly and when you arrive somewhere. But listen, brethren, we don't control the time of our departure. The type of departure that Paul is speaking about here, it's one that the emphasis all throughout the Scripture is not to control it, but to be ready for it. In Matthew, the 25th chapter, Jesus is speaking. And he gives three stories. And all three stories are not about saying, let me predict the time. You see, that's where man is always foolish. Oh, I want, I want to try to guess when the end of time is. No man knows the end of time. Oh, I want, I want to try to predict exactly when I'm going to leave this earth. You don't know exactly when. Don't fall into that kind of foolishness. Instead of rise to a spiritual height of wisdom that says, if it is right now, I want to be ready. In Matthew, the 25th chapter, he gave the, the teaching, the parable of the 10 virgins. Ten, five were foolish and five were wise. And the ones that were wise was because they were prepared for that time. And the five foolish were not prepared. Or we have the three different men that were given talents and two of them were wise because they used their talents in the way God would want. And one was not wise. And so when the great judge had to be stood before, he wasn't ready. And then that final story is the story of the day of judgment. And he shows that we're going to be judged based even how we treat the least of these. And the point is simple in all three of these. Are you going to live a life that is ready? When we think about the time here, we need to realize 
that it's not in trying to say, let me get ready for this exact time. The point is, let me be ready at any time. But I want you to notice something else here before we move on from this word. Isn't it interesting that in all of this verse six, and even in seven and eight, when he speaks of the time that it's this season in his life. In other words, Paul says, I know I've entered this season. In that season, isn't it interesting that he's making very clear the point, I don't have a future on this earth. That may not sound like a big point to you. I encourage you to jot that one down in your mind. I encourage you to jot that one down on your Sunday bulletin or something so you can take and meditate upon it this week. Because if you and I really believe that, it's going to change the way we view this time of death. It's going to change the way we even live our life on this earth. Let that sink in. In a sense, what Paul is saying is, I don't have a future on this earth. Paul, Paul, you're saying that at the time of your parts of your hand, oh, Paul, don't talk like that. Look, try to figure out a way to live a lot more years. Try to figure out a way to look younger than what you really are. Try to figure out a way to just, to just keep living and living and living. You don't see that kind of remorse in Paul's words here. Paul would quickly say, I don't have a future on this earth. I'll stay on this earth, Philippians, the first chapter, as long as the Lord needs me to do work here. But when the Lord is through with me, I'm ready to depart. How do you view this time? Do you view it with dread? Or do you view it honestly saying, I don't have anything on this earth. There is no future for me on this earth. When my time comes, I'm ready. I'd like for you to notice the second phrase, though, back in the first part of verse 6 when he talks about a drink offering. And notice this is again in the present tense when he says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The drink offering is very interesting in the sense that when you go back to the Old Testament, you see that he's using definitely Old Testament language here. It's as if he is using a metaphor that spiritual people that know the Word of God, they would understand this. People in the world would probably look at that and say, that makes no sense to me. He, he says he's a drink offering. But you go back and you read passages like Numbers, the uh, 15th chapter. And in Numbers, the 15th chapter, he gives an example of several of the offerings that were to be given. And he lists several of the burnt offerings that would be laid upon an altar. Think about, in that chapter, he talks about a lamb. He talks about a goat. He talks about uh, a, a, an animal like, such as an ox or, or some kind of uh, livestock like cattle. He talks about various types of animals that would be laid upon the altar. We usually would consider those a burnt offering. But then he also, in that very passage, speaks of a grain offering. And the grain offering, for example, and, and throughout Numbers 15, he speaks of each one and gives the proportion of how much other offerings are to be with each animal. For example, let me give you this example. And this is out of Numbers 15. If you laid a lamb and you said, this is going to be my burnt offering, you would also bring a grain offering and it would be fine flour and you would bring two quarts of a grain offering and you would mix it with some oil and you would cover that lamb with that grain offering. Now that's interesting when you think about in this passage and in several passages, it talks about a sweet aroma to the Lord. So instead of just raw meat burning on an altar, now this raw meat is coated with oil and with grain, with flour. But then there was that final offering and it was the drink offering. And the drink offering was one quart for this lamb. It would be only one quart of wine. And so this animal has been laid on the altar. This grain offering has been spread over it. And then finally, this drink offering is poured over it, which when it was burning, that wine would make a sweet aroma, even to human senses, but God said it was a sweet aroma to him. But now has your mind already gone there? 
Do you understand how appropriate this is? You remember the Lord's Supper? Bread was symbolic of what? The body. But what was the fruit of the vine symbolic of? It's symbolic of the blood. In other words, I believe that what Paul would be saying in this passage, if you said, Paul, I hear you saying verse 6, can you elaborate and help me understand it better? I believe he would say something like this. Listen, I've been offering my body in sacrifice to God for 30 years. I've been laying it on the altar. And now it is time for my final offering it is time now for me to shed my blood for Jesus Christ. It's time for me to become a blood offering to the Lord. Look back to the words of this same writer. Turn back in your Bible to Romans, the 12th chapter. In Romans, the 12th chapter, you remember this? It's the same kind of teaching when he says in Romans 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. In other words, the only reason we have opportunity to offer anything to the God is because of his mercy. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And notice this sacrifice needs to be holy, set aside, placed on the altar, if you will, of life for God's service. Holy, acceptable. Are we going to be acceptable to God? Are we going to be free from blemish and sin? Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You see, when Paul was, if you will, in the middle of his life, when he was in the thick of his life, he says, let me talk to you about, about my life. Let me talk to you about your life. We need to be a living sacrifice. Lay your life on the altar and live it for the Lord. But now Paul's talking about that season where he's about to die. And you remember Paul's death was that of execution. Paul's blood was going to be spilt as a martyr for Jesus Christ and the cause of the Christian faith. And he's saying, for 30 years, I've been fulfilling Romans 12 and verse one. And he says, right now, I'm about to add that final offering, that drink offering of my life. My blood is going to be shed. Paul, how do you feel about that? And he says, present tense, I am ready. I'm not dreading this. I'm not thinking that God is not fair right now. Why is he allowing this to happen to me? I'm not thinking, I wish something could be different. Paul says, I'm ready for my blood to be shed. It's that season in my life. I can't control that. I can only be ready for it. But what is that third thing? Notice at the end of this verse, we have the word departure. He says, in the time of my departure is at hand, 1 Timothy 4 in verse 6, the word departure, I, I shared this with you, not from this text, but I shared this with you, and my memory is not very good. It seems like just a couple of months ago. But remember, we studied departure as it relates to Paul describing death. And you remember, it is the Christian faith that linked the very word departure with death. Others do not link the word departure with death. It's the Christian faith that fueled that kind of thinking. Now, someone may say, oh, well, I know someone that's not a Christian and, and they speak of death as if it's a departure. It's because their life has been influenced by Christianity or their thinking. Let me replace that. It may not be their life, but their thinking has been influenced by Christianity. If it was not for the influence of Christianity, people would view death in a much different way. But as Christians, it's not just a view for us. As Christians, it's what we know. It is our faith. It is our hope. It is the promise of God. If we truly are devoted to the Lord, we believe in the fact that death is a departure just as certain as anything that is around us. That's the faith we have in the promise of God. So what does this word mean? This word in its root literally means to unloose. And it's illustrated in many ways. When you study this word and think about ancient descriptions, it would be the idea of unloosing an oxen's yoke. You've been working this oxen all day. He's been, he's been slave to the master all day. And then at the end of the day, you, he departs. The yoke is unloosened. He's free to go out in the pasture. 
the prisoner. The prisoner has been bound for weeks or months or years, but now he's been unloosened. He's free to go. The ship that has been close to the harbor, the big ropes have been undone, and the ship is loose to sail are the one that's used oftentimes, in, especially with this word in Hebrew, as the idea of the tent pegs have been pulled up. In Numbers, the 33rd chapter, you'll see the word depart. It's probably in there 15 to 20 times. And it is showing the movement of the children of Israel all throughout the wilderness. And he keeps using that word for loosen the tent pegs. It doesn't always have to be tent pegs, but that's the idea of it. And so he's saying that they would set up camp at one place and when they would get ready to leave that place, that they would loosen the tent pegs and they would move to another place. Now think about this. We understand that kind of language is a very positive thing. Oh, you mean the, the yoke is being taken off, I'm free. You mean that, that the prisoner's being set free. You mean that the ship is free to sail. You mean that the tent pegs are being pulled up. We're gonna go somewhere else. Paul says, that's the way I look at it. The time, the season of my departure is at hand. He didn't say the time that it's all ending the time that my spirit is crushed, I don't get to live on this earth any longer. You see, the very idea that there's grief and death is seen strongly in the scriptures. And so I'm not trying to teach or encourage anyone to not have grief and death. But I'm trying to help you to see that as Christians, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13. You see, we understand that as the physical life is coming to an end, that it is not an end of our existence. It's literally a pulling up of the tent pegs and we are departing for something else that is wonderful. So wonderful. I know this is going to sound silly, but I struggle to illustrate this. I want to give you a couple illustrations. And I know this first one may sound silly. I want some of you campers that you, you go to Fall Creek Falls and, and uh, I know a lot of you, 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 you know, you have your RVs. Pretend you don't, all right? And you're out in a tent and, and, uh, and I know that's hard for you, Aaron, but just pretend. And so, so now think, you, you've got your, you got your tent out there and you got your tent pegs. And I want you to imagine on the day that you are departing, now, I know this is silly, but I want you to imagine, you're just crying your eyes out. You're, you're literally laying on the ground wailing. You pull up a tent peg and, and you just weep and weep like there's no hope. You go over to the other tent peg and you just weep and weep. And you go over to the, another tent peg and you finally get to the very last tent peg and, and you're just sitting there and you can't pull it up and you're weeping. And a friend walks by and says, what is wrong? Look, I, I can't believe it. It's, it's about to be over. It's just terrible. And your friend doesn't even understand it. Why? I know you like camping, but why this kind of emotion? You're just packing up your tent. Just packing up my tent. What's wrong with you? And finally, your friend realizes, you think that everything's over once you pack your tent? You, you've forgotten you're packing up your tent to go back to your beautiful home that you have. You have family there. You have a wonderful community around you. You have so much there. Have you forgotten that? And imagine someone saying, I did. I really was just thinking that this tent was really all it was. Brethren, what do you think? Do you really think that this is the best? It doesn't get better than this. I hope I don't have to pack up my tent. Do we realize 
that the departure, that very word implies that there is a place we are going. And do you realize for Christians, the place that we're going is so wonderful that we ought to be able to say, when that time comes, I'm ready. Yeah, but, but Paul, what about if the method of your death is horrific, like execution? <laughs> I'm ready. I know what waits after that death. I am ready. I hope that you and I, I hope that we can recognize, even though the scriptures doesn't tell us everything about heaven, I hope that we know the scriptures well enough and we have the faith that would help us to see that whatever is waiting for us is so far superior to anything on this earth. That even though we can honestly say, I'm going to miss my family and I'm going to miss some things about this earth, but wow, what is waiting? I'm ready for that departure. Paul, how can you talk like that? This world does not have a future for me. Where I'm departing to has a wonderful, eternal future. So what have I learned today? Number one, I've learned that the winter of life is a good season for a Christian. Number two, I've learned we ought to see our life as an offering. And when we'll do that, it'll help us be unselfish, sacrificial, and focused. Number three, I learned, think of all we will be loosed from in our departure. No more pain, cemeteries, depression, fighting temptation. Think of all the things we'll be loosed from, but also think about all the things we'll see on our arrival. I don't know what it is for you where you can look back and say, at that moment, I saw fill in the blank. And you say, I could, I could just had to stand there and soak it up. I couldn't believe it. That's what we're going to see in heaven. We're going to arrive and our jaw is going to drop and we're going to say, can you believe this? I wanted to stay longer in that tent when this was what was waiting This whole lesson is built around the idea of finish strong. You and I ought to want to finish strong because what we are leaving, whatever it is, what we are longing for is so much greater. This morning, how's your finish? You say, well, I, I don't know. It hasn't happened yet. Yes, you do know. Because you see, you don't set the time. What you do is say, I'm going to be ready right now. And whenever it happens, I'll be ready right now. And so we literally, as faithful Christians, live each day in view of the finish. And so again, I ask the question, how's your finish? If it was right now, how's your finish? And don't leave here this morning saying, it wouldn't be good for me. Your soul... God loves you. He wants to save you. He wants to spend an eternity with you. Don't throw that away. There's not anybody here that deserves it. Well, if you only knew what I've done, it, trust me, God knows and He still loves you. He still sheds His grace towards you. He still wants to save you. It doesn't matter. God wants to spend an eternity with you, but it's your choice. Will you finish strong? If you never become a Christian, why not today? Be baptized into Christ as a believer, willing to repent of sins and confess before men. If you've begun that journey and along the way you haven't been living so strong and you want to come back and confess sin and pray forgiveness, let's make sure that as we leave here this morning, every one of us is living a life so that if we breathe our last breath today, we would be finishing strong. And tonight we'll come back and look for motives of how to do that. If we can help you in any way, come as we stand as we sing.